So characteristic classes. So this is something that everyone learns, but over the years I've maybe figured out a couple things that are fun connections to make, um, different uh, ways to go about it. Um, so yeah, let me start. Um, first, let me try to set the world record for uh, fast definition. So the basic object of study is a vector bundle. Um, and I'm going to assume a manifold base, which isn't much of an assumption if you say you just care about finite complexes and maybe things you can get from limits of those, because um, any finite complex is in homotopy equivalent to some manifold. You just embed it in Euclidean space and you fatten it up. Um, and let's remember that we have these tome classes. Well, if I've got a, a vector bundle over a manifold and I'm looking for a submanifold, there is, um, as Raoul Bott would say, a God-given one, namely the zero section um, inside. So the Euler class of E by abuse, I'm, I'm just going to call it standard abuse, call it by the total space rather than the map, is just going to be the tome class of this zero section. And that's in the cohomology of E. And it can either be Z if you, um, if, if things are, um, co if E is oriented, then M, ZM will be co-oriented, um, you know, or if Z is not oriented, I can consider it just in, in Z mod two coefficients. Um, so there we go. There's the Euler class in, I don't know, um, 10, 15 seconds. Maybe I should practice a little bit and get it get it going even faster. Um, but, the, uh, but the point is that, of course, um, this I cheated maybe a little bit. I gave you something in the cohomology of E. Well, now P is a homotopy equivalence. But if you, if you really want to uh, quibble with the speed, you could say, well, let's, let's make it um, in the cohomology of M. So um, all you need is any F from M back to E, um, which is an equivalence. Um, so in particular, a section. And then what you can do is if, um, and we, we want this F to be transverse to the zero section. In which case, then um, the Euler class of E is going to be um, the tome class of the preimage of the zero section. So this is for any um, any map, um, any bundle, um, but you get a, a, a corollary then. Um, corollary of the definition is that um, uh, the Euler class of E is zero if E has a non-zero section. So, um, so that's the Euler class. It's just, if you've got a vector bundle over a manifold, you can name a submanifold of the total space. And that that submanifold is the Euler class. Um, since I saved so much time in the definition, um, let me meander a bit and say that this is a close cousin to the tome class. Now, of course, um, I'm using tome cochains, but this is the standard tome classes in. Um, the tome isomorphism theorem. Um, so let's recall that we want to sometimes consider the disks um, in such a bundle uh, modulo the spheres. So you're, um, and if you've got a compact base, that's <laughs> just taking one point compactification. So you're, you're taking your vector bundle and you're taking all of these points out here and you're, you're coning them off. And then, um, and then I, I want to say that uh, that you could still look at Z 
M inside here. Um, it's not a manifold, but again, we can, um, we, we can get around that. We can think about things away from this base point and, and argue appropriately in reduced cohomology, for example. And the, um, so, so this is the, um, the usual tome class, which corresponds to the, um, uh, well, this, is, this I claim is the usual tome class. Moreover, the, um, the tome isomorphism is going to send more generally a tau w for w inside of m to um, its image under the zero section. So this is a cochain on the tone class of E. Notice that its co-dimension has increased by the rank of E. The real rank of E, if we're doing some other flavor. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, let me draw a picture over here. Uh, if I wanna think about M as the base as maybe something two dimensional and I, you know, just for, for limits and drawing, we think of, of, of a one dimensional bundle over it. And then I'm taking the things off that infinity and I'm coning them off. So, and everything up here, here gets coned off. Then whenever I've got a submanifold W in M, well, it also lives in this total space. And the tome isomorphism is um, the map is given by just taking that class to um, to itself. Um, the dimension has changed, so it's that's a, a, a very geometric way to to consider what the tome isomorphism does. Now the proof that's an isomorphism. I won't go through it because it's um, what I tell my students is uh, that eventually they'll appreciate just a standard five lemma argument. So. You use the fact that, that this is just suspension isomorphism. If you've got a trivial bundle and you, you play around, you have to, the key with five of arguments is, is that there is a delicate commutativity usually, but that's, that's the argument. So those are the Euler class and the Tome classes. And, and now it should be no mystery that developing um, characteristic classes can be done through um, Tome isomorphisms. But let's now um, shift back to our perspective. Um, so let's think about what other submanifolds. So other submanifolds uh, constructed from in E from its vector bundle structure. Well, <clears throat> pretty much the Euler class is the only one that strictly speaking you can talk about an E itself, um, it's, you know, the game is you're not allowed to, to, to talk in terms of coordinates. I can't say, well, what about the submanifold where say the first coordinate vanishes? Cause there's no such thing as a first coordinate that that definition can twist as you go around. Um, but one thing you can say is, oh, what about two um, vectors which are linearly dependent? That's a sort of coordinate free statement. And what you can do is, um, we're going to define w n minus one. So I'll just do the, the mod two version, et cetera, um, to be um, represented. So tau of the submanifold represented by um, two vectors um, such that two vectors which are linearly dependent in E. So not in E plus E, but in E, I should say that. So you can count co-dimensions and the, the first was co-dimension N that was manifest, but this is now co-dimension N minus one in, inside this space. So we can go back and say, this is um, subspace of E that, um, which is one vector, which is linearly dependent. And then it's clear what we should do in general, Wn minus i corresponds to the submanifold of um, E plus itself, i plus one times of, um, 
uh, i plus one vectors, which are um, linearly dependent. And so there they are. These are, are some things that, um, that given a bundle, you can define these in the total space. Obviously, we can do what we did before. If I want to get the, the, the cohomology classes back in the base, I just take some, some section now of, um, of these direct sum, uh, section, of, section of this direct sum, so a bunch of sections. Um, and then, of course, um, it certainly what is the right thing to do to, to think about what axioms um, these satisfy. So, um, you know, or, or just think about their properties and then set them later as axioms, if, if you will. Um, so, uh, functorality. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, if you pull back a bundle, then these submanifolds will, will pull back. Um, that's pretty immediate. Um, if I look at, if I want to take the values on um, the trivial bundle, which is just m cross r, m cross r, n, um, at, and note that that's zero, that's, uh, we already said that. And the other case in the, in the, um, that you need to consider in the real setting is the Mobius bundle. And again, that's now a little calculation that you can make, again, thankfully with a, with a picture. So I've got the zero section, this is my base. I take some other image. Um, again, I don't need to, to take a section, so why don't I sort of do something like this? Um, and then obviously this is transverse and it just hits once and that's a generator. Um, of, and of course we've got identifications uh, on these ends. This is S1, um, this is the Mobius band or the infinite Mobius band, if you will. Um, and so this is a generator of, of H upper one. So, um, so we verify that axiom. Um, and then of course the, um, the one that makes it all work and we're gonna reflect on that too is the Whitney sum axiom. Which says that um, these are related if you've got a sum of vector bundles. You can take these characteristic classes of the components, take those cut products, and you get, um, well, and then sum, sum over those, and you get the, the nth G full Whitney class with a direct sum. So this is what I was. Uh, telling Jim Stashef ahead of time, but um, I hope he takes no offense that I, that I say that the, the proof of this um, is in Milner and Stashef is probably not the one you want because um, they deduce it from the Carton formula. And I'll explain why that's a, so, somewhat of a, that's a, a, an important connection between these two, the Carton formula and the Whitney sum formula. But if anything, I think that, um, this is more basic and, and maybe you deduce Carton from, from that, but I'll, I'll come back to that either late this lecture or uh, next lecture um, when we I discuss. I think I'd agree. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Jim. <laughs> so um, let me give two cases of a new proof. Oops, let's see. Um, and let me actually switch to, and I'll have to find my way. Um, so, let me find my way here to the other part of the board. If you're following on the board at home, then you can move as well. Okay, I think that's about right. So um, let me give you two cases of a new proof. Um, I suspect that this is 
how Whitney did it, it's kind of hard to, um, the, the paper he wrote was just a more of an announcement. Um, it appeared in a series like in 1941 and everybody cites it and I couldn't get my hands on it for, for this. And it's harder since I don't have um, either of the libraries that um, I should have access to uh, in, in person. So anyways, um, this, this may or may not be a, a new proof um, of Whitney's sum. But let's let's talk first about the easiest. What if E is rank I and F is rank J and I plus J equals N? So then, what we want to do is we want to consider um, we want to consider the uh, E plus F and and we're looking just we we want to think about the Euler class of E plus F. <laughs> And you've got these projection maps. And very concretely, then, um, if I've got Wi of E is the Euler class, then that's the zeros inside here. And the pre image is just um, things of the form zero plus x inside here. So that's the submanifold representing Wi E in, in this larger total space. And similarly, I can look at the submanifold of um, um, of y plus zeros <sighs> my apologies why is this not um, Okay, similarly, we can look at the, um, the submanifold of y direct sum zeros inside here, and that corresponds to wj, f. And then something that we'll focus on later is that um, cup product at the cohomology level does um, uh, correspond to intersections. So, of course, if I take the collection of things of this form and intersect them with things of this form, that's just the zeros. So that corresponds to Wn of E plus F, and that's these correspond to Wi E. Intersection corresponds to cup Wjf. So, um, so that shouldn't be that surprising. It's fairly straightforward. With Euler classes, notice that the equality is happening really at the co-chain level. A more interesting case that I'll share, um, I won't share the general case, is, um, is say a, a sum of two line bundles. So let E and F uh, be line bundles. Then, um, so then we want to show that W1 of, well, I don't want W2 because that's the Euler class that I just considered. So let's just consider W1 of E plus F is um, W1 E W0 F plus W0 E W1 F W0 being the, um, unit by convention. I think the geometry works out here. So what does this correspond to? We said this corresponds to, it's represented by uh, pairs of linearly dependent vectors in the direct sum of this with itself. And I'm gonna think in, in local coordinates. So this is, at least locally I can say, well, I've got, um, it's a line bundle. So everything's this, the some scalar multiple of a vector I'll call E1 for E. And then I've got another scalar multiple when I've got the second factor of E of that same E1. And then the, the um, locally I'm calling the, the vector F1 for the, the spanning vector of F. So I can think of this locally and um, and again, you have to be then careful, but um, 
so what I want to then say is such that a d equals b c, right? So I'm using coordinates, but now this this uh, equation expresses linear um, dependence, and so it's it will continue to hold when I change coordinates um, if the line bundle is twisted. Okay, so that's um, that's one way to think about that. Now let's go over and and play similar games here. And what I want to do is I want to, um, as I did with the Euler classes, think about things um, through projections. And I'll choose wisely. So here, I again, I'm going to have a e1 plus b f1 plus c e1 plus d f1 is my, um, is my vector. And if I play with the projections, um, I'm going to say such that either a equals zero or d equals zero. So if a equals zero, um, that means that I'm zero on, um, on the first section. So this is going to represent w um, one e. And there is no condition um, coming from f, so w zero f. And this is going to represent w zero e w one f. So we have this uh, condition that a equals zero or d equals zero. I better known as a times d is zero. So here we've got a d equals b c, and here we've got a d equals zero. Well, of course, I can interpolate. I can consider a d equals s times b c, where s is in zero one. Again, that's a, something in coordinates that actually defines um, a, a submanifold, uh, well defines a submanifold uh, regardless of coordinates. And it gives a boundary that is um, that uh, on either side is, are the two sides of the Whitney sum formula. So um, in this case, I, uh, I, there, there's no, um, identification that I could find. I conjecture that there probably is none um, where you could observe both sides and see the same cochain on both sides, that there's something um, sort of intrinsic about uh, the need for, or something, yeah. Uh, there, there is an honest need for a co-bounding object uh, for the two sides of the Whitney sum formulas. So let me, let me sort of just say, it would be nice to, um, uh, you know, is, is this uh, occurred elsewhere? Of course, in Durand theory, you've got um, like Chernvay theory, um, uh, which which also co-bounds these things. Um, but this this seems like its own flavor, and um, you know it'd be nice to to have a general proof accessible. Um, one that I've I've looked at other cases, but as we all know, there's not a lot of, um, can't exactly publish in the best journals to, if you, if you prove a result that's 80 years old. Um, but, um, but the other interesting thing to think about is what are the roles of this, uh, of these co-boundaries? Um, that's kind of an interesting thing. And as, as I come back to um, the relationship with Steenort operations, Again, at the end of this lecture, the beginning next one, that might be a, a fun thing to, to speculate about. So, so there we have it. Um, that, that, that argument generalized uh, would give the, the Whitney sum formula. And um, so this shows that these things uh, exist. There are objects with those properties. Um, and you know, I think the, uh, you know, let's give due credit to, to Jim Stasheff and Jack Milner for, for putting things together um, really well in general. And from there, I don't think there's a lot to add um, to the calculation, but let me add, try to add just a little bit. Um, I was just the scribe. You were just a scribe. <laughs> well, you were an, an excellent scribe, Jim. So. Thank you. <laughs> So let's, um, the goal is going to be to talk a little bit about homology, but let's, 
um, let's let's remember that there's this um, the the representing objects. So um, repair compact X because we talked about classifying spaces last time. Again, I'm not going to improve um, if these are complex vector bundles. I'm not going to improve on Jim and Jack's expo exposition here. But what I did want to say is that it connects with what we were doing last time. And, and you could reprove this in another way. So um, <clears throat> one thing you can say is that a, um, a principal UN bundle y over x can give a vector bundle by, um, well, it's got a UN action. I'm going to use the UN action on, um, on the standard representation of UN on CN. And, um, and take the quotient, and then that's going to be a vector bundle. Um, going the other way, if I've got a vector bundle over X, I can consider the fiber-wise automorphisms and then check that that's going to be a bundle whose automorphisms are the structure group of, of E. So this is not meant to, to elucidate anything about characteristic classes per se, but connect it with the previous lecture that says, one reason why BG is important is that if G occurs as automorphisms of, of X, then fiber bundles of, with fiber X are really gonna be um, maps into, into BG. You also clarify that things like reduction of structure group here. Um, so maybe my vector bundle is, is obtained through, um, through some principal uh, G bundle, it's, what do they call those? The flat, um, well, they are not all flat bundles are there. Well, maybe just the, anyways, um, maybe my, my bundle actually has a, a smaller structure group and that tells me that the characteristic classes would factor through that group cohomology. So that's one thing to, um, to say. And then the other is that um, to, to then connect with the standard approach, is that G, R, N, C, infinity is the natural, as in sort of out in nature, um, not functorial, geometric model um, for BUN. And um, so why is that? Well, let's just, um, again, this is a chance to just kind of review from last time. I claim that um, UN will always act on the space of N frames in CN. And moreover, that this space gets more and more highly connected as N goes to infinity. So in fact, this space fibers over frames Frames are just linearly, um, oh, sorry, not just linearly independent, but then orthogonal or unitary um, collections of, of uh, vectors that are, that are pairwise um, uh, have inner product zero. If I have an N minus one frame um, and I'm trying to think about how I fill it in, then I just need another vector. It's gonna be a unit vector. Um, it's then going to be in the orthogonal complement of my n minus one frame, and so that gives me s, gives me this degree, sort of plus one from complex, but minus one from here or minus two from here. So um, this space of n frames, if um, as n gets large, all of these spaces um, get more and more highly connected, so that becomes contractible, and then the orbits of um, a frame under UN are just one-to-one uh, -one correspondence with their span. So the quotient um, is just gonna be in dimensional subspaces 
of, well, if I take the limit C infinity. Um, so that's, um, that's an advertisement for, there's a lot of, of work. Then, then, for example, you'd have Schubert cells, which if you just worked abstractly somehow with the, with the classifying space model uh, I gave last time, you wouldn't have access to. So, but again, I'm, I'm very highly ecumenical. And so I like having both around. In fact, let me give you a digression um, using both models. So let's mix the, um, the, the simplicial and the natural geometric models. And this is an idea due to um, Bruno Harris, my colleague when I was a postdoc at Brown, he explained this to me, um, or at least he pointed me to his paper on it. Um, namely, so let's consider um, BVU. So BU is um, the classifying space for the infinite unitary group, or we can think of it as direct limits. So I've got linear subspaces of a very large dimensional vector space. Um, let's take that geometric model, but mix it with the, the, the take the, the simplicial B. So that means in this model that, that I'm gonna label with elements of the Grassmannian which I'll, I'll, um, I'll just quickly write as that. So for every point, I've got some sort of, if this is C infinity, I've got some subspace in there and then a different subspace at every point. And then, um, well, let's, let's rewrite this. So let's take this and identify the two ends. That it's, it's actually because things vanish as they go, to the um, to the ends, this is equivalent. In fact, I, I mentioned this as you as if you take the at least in the free abelian group case, you can think of this on the sphere instead of a cube. And at every point here, um, so I've got a few points which are labeled by um, by subspaces. And what I'm going to do is think of uh, this is S1. Now I'm going to think of this uh, in the plane. And remember, I'm, I'm unitary. Um, so I'm going to think of these values as the eigenvalues of some matrix, and these as the um, eigenspaces with that eigenvalue. And um, well, uh, again, I, it would be way too much to give a full proof. Um, again, look in Bruno Harris's paper, but uh, eigenvalues and eigenspaces of something in, in um, C infinity, um, that seems like the infinite unitary group. Um, so we've connected the classifying space on BU to the infinite unitary group these are homotopy equivalent, and that's this amazing fact, periodicity, uh, called bot periodicity. And there's there's other proofs out there for sure. There's there's um, the, the the analysis ones actually give more than the topology ones. Um, and bot's original is 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 beautiful, but this is one way to um, to just from a purely topological point of view, classifying spaces to, to relate. Um, why should BBU have anything to do with you? Well, here's, here's a model which indicates a, a, a relationship. So, um, so that's, uh, let's end the digression and actually let me go to my second board. And what I wanna do is then, um, is talk about uh, homology um, and cohomology together for a bit. So, so characteristic classes 
um, we can think of them as cohomology VU, but let's think of them as a moment for cohomology VUN. If you want, you can um, just think of the rank as a characteristic class somehow. Um, and let's also consider the dual homology object. And what I want to do is, is play around the, with the pairing. So that's another thing I like to emphasize and, and it's not so much a geometric view of algebraic topology, but just enhancing our understanding of spaces by having essentially both bases and bases for homology, cohomology and their pairings. Sometimes the story is, is richer than if you just try to understand a homology group. So the point is that the, this is of course the homology of the disjoint union. There's an annoying completion um, preventing the, the statement, um, the cohomology statement, but you know, fairly immediate, not, not terribly relevant. And this is an H space under direct sum. And it's actually homotopy commutative. Uh, H space under direct sum. So that implies that the homology is a bialgebra. And um, so then the first case we'll take as, as, a, as a given calculated, well, BU1 is um, CP infinity. And so we can say that's well spanned by bi, which are represented in the usual way as just fundamental classes of projective spaces. And then you can, um, we want to, to use this, this um, uh, H space structure. We wanna um, use the fact that the homology is a bi algebra. So that means that I'm going to uh, pay attention to the cup co-products here. And that's um, simple enough, namely delta Bn is um, the sum of Bi tensor Bj over all I plus J adding to N. And that's dual to the usual statement in cohomology that Xi cup Xj is Xn for all I plus J equals N in the cohomology of CP infinity. So we've got this, um, this calculation to get us started. And then, um, and then what I wanna do is, is let's consider the pairing. So let's, um, let me uh, just set it up as a little matrix. So for example, um, I can take uh, C1 cubed, C1, C2, or C3 um, in the cohomology of uh, BU3 or, or higher, or I can take B1 cubed, but I'll use star because it's the homology product, um, B2 star B1 star B0, or B3 star B0 squared. Um, you can admit, omit the, the B zeros. Um, and I want to evaluate here. And uh, let's go through some of these calculations. Um, so I claim that, for example, um, this um, C1 cubed on B3 equals one in the cohomology of, of BU3 because it's really, um, uh, and well, so this fact follows immediately from the isomorphisms in that degree with, uh, or the map in that degree with the cohomology, this fact in the cohomology of CP infinity. 
So there's there's a bit of, of, of naturality. So in general, C1 to the I is going to um, evaluate on on BI. That's that's what happens in the cohomology of CP infinity. And so this is one. Um, this um, this is zero because um, uh, all of these have multiple routes you can take. But um, here, I really want to think of these characteristic classes of a line bundle with um, direct sum two trivial bundles. This is the Euler class, and so that's that's zero. Um, similarly, you get um, zero. This is because Euler class. Just good exercise to, to make some of these calculations. Um, let's make a more, um, let's see, where do I wanna go next? Um, let's go all the way up to uh, C1 cubed on a couple of classes. So, so you can see how the, um, Algebra, coalgebra structures, and the other, the direct sum algebra, coalgebra structures play together. So I want to calculate that. Um, so what you can do is say, well, this is um, the multiplication map in cohomology of C1 tensor C1 tensor C1. And I want to evaluate that on B1 cubed. Then you use some naturality and push it over and say, okay, well, then that means if I can calculate this on a um, on the coproduct, so iterated. Um, so this is, I guess, mu on mu. I'll I'll, I'll by abuse just say mu, mu squared and delta squared on um, uh, b one ten. Uh, B1 cubed. And now we're going to use the bialgebra compatibility and say, well, I know what this is. I've got B1 tensor one plus one tensor B1 is the coproduct of B1. And then I've got to, and this is star three. And so then I've got to star this with itself um, three times. And um, I won't then do all the expansion, but we'll find um, six because there's six different ways that I can get uh, B1 tensor B1 tensor B1 in this uh, game. Uh, let's see. I haven't been monitoring the chat. Ah, um, Submanifold yielding Stiefel any classes smooth. Um, yeah, if your original manifold is, then um, then these will all be smooth. Absolutely, um, we're just assuming that things have a manifold base. My my apologies for not a, um, uh, bringing up the chat before. B B U is S U. Uh, yes, I think you're probably right, and so um, yeah, I, I should change that in the notes. Um, and is there a nice way to make it into a strictly associative topological monoid? Um, associative probably, but definitely not commutative um, because um, there's gonna be some non-trivial dyer lashoff operations, which is something we might talk about at some point. Um, so again, my apologies for not um, monitoring that sooner. So let's put this six back in and then just let me fill this, um, fill the rest in. Um, I don't want to spend too long with these kinds of calculations, but you really can just use bi algebra. And you get this matrix for, um, ah, let me uh, move back over. You get this matrix for the um, homology cohomology pairing. And I want to compare that with. Um, Compare that with uh, uh, symmetric functions. Uh, 
So um, you can take a, the standard basis is, um, so let's let F sigma i as usual be the ith elementary symmetric function. And, and I'll, I'll have my variables um, be x's. And then um, there's the combinatorialists will tell you all sorts of things uh, and various types of algebraists about um, different ways you can make symmetric functions. But the two that you might, well, the, the most basic one is to, um, is to actually symmetrize things. So if I have something that's not symmetric, I can of course um, make it so. And so then if you take your usual monomial basis, so for example, well, x1, x2, x3 is also, is already symmetric. If I'm thinking pairing, maybe I'll think about the linear dual of this. Whereas something like x1 squared um, x2, I would need to symmetrize um, and I get something symmetric. Um, and then finally, I would have, for example, x1 cubed plus x2 cubed plus x3 cubed is something symmetric. So that's symmetrizing the standard monomial basis. And then if you, um, you know, sigma one cubed um, is what? Let's just remember that sigma one is um, x1 plus x2 plus x3 cubed. And if I expand that, I actually get that this occurs six times, this occurs exactly once, this occurs three times. So, um, so this follows from the standard treatments such as in Milner and Stashef, but it's probably not uh, appreciated so much that, um, I mean, two facts. First is that the homology of BU N is um, spanned by classes, which are products of the um, of CPI, and then take fundamental classes of those, and those are um, you know standard kind of line bundle mapping products of line bundle mapping into um, in plane bundle, and I can let I equal zero. So that's, um, that's immediate from the standard cohomology calculation, but usually isn't sort of um, stopped and appreciated. And then the, the, the other thing that is, that also follows, but that, that uh, just deserves more mention is that um, the homology and cohomology of BU is this um, self-dual Hopf algebra. So it's isomorphic to the self-dual Hopf algebra. of symmetric functions. Symmetric polynomials in any variable, in, any, in, in a say countably infinite sequence of variables. Um, so, and it's the, the self-dual Hopf algebra is just in whatever you wanna call it. So whether we call it sigma i or ci or the bi, the, the formula is always the same that you get a polynomial algebra. Um, so I should have said that polynomial on. On um, sigma i or ci or bi or wh whichever, um, which whichever variables are using, polynomial on those with this one co-product, and it's um, and then the remarkable thing is it's linear dual. It is also polynomial on a comparable set of variables with the same co-product. So that's kind of this this amazing fun um, combinatorial miracle. Um, so. Um, so yeah, this is, this is an advertisement for, um, considering not just 
calculating homology or cohomology with whatever structure, but but sort of both together. And in this case, the natural pairing, I would say, is not Kronecker. Um, um, so let me let me also then just put out there, like I, I, I see, and maybe someone in the audience, feel free to say in the chat, um, there's, uh, there's at least one other basis, um, a basis uh, distinct from these, from the homology and coal, the natural ones. Again, you could, uh, yeah, the, we, we, we know that anyways, you can talk about um, homology and cohomology separately or pairing, or if you're given one and um, you can you can talk about a dual basis. Um, so a basis distinct from these is um, is the Schubert cells. And you can say in either homology through cell structure, um, or cohomology through tome classes, you have to be careful because um, um, there these, the, 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 the things which map are not um, nice uh, sub-manifolds there. You have to blow things up to, to have your Schubert, um, something that sort of captures your Schubert cell, the closure of your Schubert cell. But anyways, um, those are those are two other possible ways to make bases of homology and cohomology. And a question I have, and I know it's, I know this, um, I think it's, uh, uh, I think it's implicit in some work in higher rank by by people like Dan Yang at Illinois. But um, um, how do these? And then there's a, the, the question about other bases as well, would be fun. Um, just kind of, uh, among other things, pointing out things that would be fun to, to have in the literature, expository literature, you know, uh, 60 plus years after uh, Milner and Stashoff. Um, oh, that makes me feel old. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. <laughs> no. It comes with the territory. So let me um, let me say one other thing about this. We've got five minutes, which I think is about right. So we had. Um, although let me now go back up um, up to the right. Great. So what we had was, um, if you reflect on what Milner and Stashev do is there's, um, so the, the map, so you've got product of uh, BU1 maps to BUN because you can say map things as diagonal matrices in and it's functorial, however you want to say it, or classifying um, uh, uh, direct sums of line bundles. And then the map on cohomology, this is the map we were just talking about implicitly when we were talking about um, symmetric functions that this is injective. And mapping out cohomology like this is, um, so, so I wanna talk a little bit uh, because it'll figure prominently when we eventually get to cohomology of symmetric groups. This is, um, ah, Andy Baker, sure functions give a dual basis, self dual basis over Z. Okay, thanks Andy. Um, so um, this map is injective. And what I wanted to talk a little bit about is in general, if H um, is inside G, then of course, uh, 
VH maps to BG. And we can think of it um, just explicitly in our little model because all of these then um, are elements of, of BG. So it's really a subspace. So there's a restriction map on cohomology. Um, and um, what I want to talk about a little bit is how this, this picture of symmetric polynomials uh, has a vast generalization. So namely, the first, um, so first note that um, by conjugation, G acts on this simplicial BG, right? So if I have G1 and G2, and then I, I've got some element little g in here, then I can just conjugate both of these, right? And, and whoever else occurs. So you've got conjugation action um, on the simplicial model. And then I claim is that, um, that this is homotopic for any g the action of little g on bg is homotopic to the identity on um, bg. And how is that? Well, I, I think about this as, um, you know, let's remember these particles on, on the interval can collide and multiply. So really this, this here is g1 with a g on the left and a g inverse on the right. And, um, I, I own a couple dogs and, and whether like today, if I take them out, then they'll eventually um, get a little cold and want to shake off the water. And similarly, G1 and G2 here, or, or more generally, however I want to do it, can start shaking off the G and G inverse. And they continue to um, to move in that direction until they either um, go off the end or um, or annihilate, right? So, so you can eventually you have G1, G2, and then things which are either very close to each other, and they'll just be G1 inverse G pairs, or um, or some things are going to the left and right, and then eventually. Um, they disappear. And you can write down a, 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 a homotopy. I always have to, to uh, be skeptical myself because more than once I've uh, shown things that are, that shown, shown things that uh, I thought were contractible, but they were just path connected. So what you have to say is really this, this homotopy exists for any uh, collection BG I start with and they fit together into a continuous um, object altogether. Um, and then they do. So, um, so then, well, if H is um, a subgroup of G, then I can also, if it's, um, uh, implies that the uh, normalizer of H acts on BH the same way. Um, and then the, the, the claim is that the restriction from the cohomology of BG to the cohomology of BH factors through the uh, normalizer of H mod H, which is sometimes called the vial group of H invariance. And that's because this action um, the, of, the, um, of, of the normalizer must be trivial on the cohomology of BG because the normalizer sits inside of, of G itself. Um, and we just showed that the action of of G itself on the cohomology of BG is trivial. So that shows you must map to these invariants and then um, by the normalizer, but then um, H is gonna act trivially on its cohomology. So you might as well just think of the vial group. And the point is then that um, 
that u1 to the n sits inside u n, and this is our h, and this is our g, and our vial group is the nth symmetric group. So this is a key example. Um, and the first and, and probably still most important example, but this really um, leads to a lot of uh, nice uh, perspective and group cohomology and, and great connections with invariant theory, um, as we've already seen with the characteristic classes. So I think I will uh, stop there for today um, and uh, probably do more connecting characteristic classes with Steenrod operations next time. So I'll pause, I'll ask for any questions from uh, folks who don't mind their questions recorded, and then I'll stop the live stream and, and uh, answer more questions. So, yeah, so Andy, I need to study the sure functions. Presumably they're, they are the ones that are um, uh, um, Montes Schubert, um, I, I think I think they are yes. Um, I I always get confused about the. I mean, what what is remarkable is that they are a self-dual basis. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, if I'd known that when I was writing my thesis, it would have saved me a hell of a lot of work. Because <laughs> <laughs> I work with, I work with the monomial basis in the homology of BU, mm -hmm. and I was calculating it using monomials in the Chern classes. Uh-huh, right. And the and so problem is that they're not a dual basis. <clears throat> right. They're not as, dual as basis. Just showed, so, right. Yeah, so so you end up doing a lot of calculations that are basically well, I mean, if, if you could turn everything into the, the set in terms of the self-dual basis, it would be a lot easier. Because mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. still have to do some kind of linear algebra to do that. But um yeah. It was a mirror, it always seemed miraculous to me when I learned that there was a self dual basis of that type. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. yeah it's, it seems like an area that would be nice to to have a little further yeah. exposition to to let, let folks know yeah. that there's the I mean, getting through I, I it one way. Is... It's, it's, something else that's worth saying is that um, if you think about the homology and cohomology of BU as a graded Hopf algebra. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Another way to sort of produce it is you take for each n you take the representation ring of sigma of, of S n, right, mm -hmm. and you put those together to form a graded object, and then you define uh, you use induction from products of symmetric groups to symmetric groups, and you use mm -hmm. restriction. To define the Hopf algebra structure, and that's the same thing. That's the same Hopf algebra. <clears throat> right, and that's I, I should have mentioned. Was is that perspective? I mean, it probably predates him, but I think of this book by Zelovinsky that that does some. Yeah, yeah, sure. That, that that well, that yes. I mean, he built up from what was already in the literature. Right. right. But thinking about the representation theory ring part of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, another way, if you forget the grading, it's also the universal lambda ring. Mm. <laughs> on one generator, which is another <laughs> important fact, which, which is important in K theory, where the grading sort of vanishes. If you if you take K theory of BU mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and don't worry about the completion, <clears throat> it's also the same object. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's the big bit vectors as well. That's the other. Yeah, all these things are fantastic ways of talking about the same object. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And kind of needed. It's often, I, I, yeah. I, this is sort of meta-mathematics, but it's sort of like having different bases for a vector space. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. 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 Great. Thanks, Andy. Any, any other questions or comments? Um, I will <clears throat> stop the live stream in just a moment then, if anybody's shy.